16th of December 2023, you're welcome back. Sean Quinn has written a book. He was on the telly the other night on Primetime and he had a launch of the book in the Steve Russell Hotel. I thought didn't want him in there at all, but he was there and he got a good crowd. He got a good crowd at it. Now, I have very mixed things to say about Sean Quinn. I only spoke to him briefly a, a few times. I was at a conference which he chaired and he didn't do a bad job. It was by the Construction Industry Federation promoting concrete products and all that. Now, he started off and he did well. He pushed, he had plenty of drive and he took an area of the country which was West Cavan, uh, South Leitrim and Fermanagh, a, a, a very poor part of the country which had very little industry industry in it and he did bring jobs and he did do a lot of good work industrially he was a prolific industrialist but he was too prolific in my opinion now what the way it was he had to have everything not only in that area but in ireland and beyond he had to have everything there's a local company called Kingspan, which were selling radiators into the English market. And he began selling them as well. And there was some bit of a chat between some of the CEOs of the two companies, two cabin based companies, because Quinn is, although he's from Mana, he's kind of cabin more too, you know, there were two more as cabin, he is cabin connected too. And two cabin uh, companies, east and west, I admit, two different parts. And uh, there were the, the Kingscourt crowd were trying to get him to, to um, not be competing on radiators, pick something else. He wouldn't hear tell of it. He wouldn't entertain it at all. The only thing you could get down to Ballyconnell was a hairdresser's or a coffee shop. If you went to set up a little industry down there, he'd, he'd put you out. Now, the right way for him to run his business was have his core businesses and let others then develop on the foot of it. If you take the town of Carrickburg Cross, there's a good lot of, of industry around it and a good lot of resources. Kingscourt has a good lot of resources as well with gypsum and all of that. And there are spin-off industries then on that. And there's a sales market as well. There's spin-off industries on that. People can set up other little industries which are getting some of that money and uh, without the main companies having a say. But Quinn couldn't do that. And he, 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 he reminds me of a greengrocer at one time, and he, there was a, a poor devil trying to rear a family in the same street as him. There was two greengrocers and, and, and general provisions. And this fella would keep pulling down the price. If the neighbour got a consignment of lettuce in and he was selling it with two pence of a, of a, of a profit per head, your man would sell his at a loss to try and stop him out. There's people like that. There's people, greedy people like that. And Quinn admitted in my company at that conference that he was greedy. He said he was greedy. And he was, by God, was he greedy. He was as greedy as you would get. As greedy as you would get. Now, he wanted everything. He wanted everything. Uh, I don't know, was there anyone running a little lorry service or anything? Was there anyone doing anything? Everything seemed to be done by him. Uh, in, 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 in the northeast here, you get companies and they have a lot of transport and then they, they hire out their repair work to private companies. It looked that that didn't happen much with Quinn. Now, it has to be said, when he had the insurance, he always paid. He was a good man to pay people who did work on cars and all that. And that was one area he did not try to control. He let, uh, he, 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 he more or less let small panel beaters do the work for him. So it wasn't altogether that he didn't allow any anyone to, else to, to get up. But a classic example was his insurance. The insurance uh, company he had was based on the fact that if you had an accident and you're injured, or even whether you're injured or not, he'd send someone out to you. He'd get somebody, part-time workers and all that, or retired people, and they got 200 euros if they could entice you to settle. You would sign on the dotted line that you would you would accept whatever amount there was. And that was to do out the lawyers. So if he got his way, the, 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 the road traffic accident section that the, co that the solicitors and barristers make a bit of money out of, and they have to live too. I'm not that fond of some of them, but they have to live. 
uh, would be gone. And he was direct, he called it fast track. He was directly trying to, to um, do out the solicitors that they'd be cut out of it. And anyone that fell for it and, and took the took what he gave them. Now, on the other hand, if he arrived and your car was written off and he gave you a Midland deal, you could argue, well, sure, at least you got paid and it was all over and you had no messing about. But you'd get that with an ordinary insurance company anyway. Point is, he wanted, didn't want any solicitor for anyone else getting anything. He wanted to grab all, to grab it all. And he'd blow you off the road. So his lorries would blow you off the road. They must have been doing two trips from Ballyconnell to Kingsford for, for the gypsum every day. They'd blow you off the road, so they would. Now, um, right, so he was greedy. He didn't like competition locally or anywhere else. And he got caught when he went into contracts for differences. He'll say he didn't sign anything. His family signed. He had all this business. And he signed it for contracts for differences. And when he was gambling on owning Anglo-Irish Bank, he bought the shares, we'll say, in June to for without paying for them on the condition that he'd pay for them the following year or whatever and that they'd go up in price they went down in price or well, as he was doing that there was two guys in america and there's a film on one of them uh, the big short there was a fellow called paul Polson, and there was a few others that gambled everything they had and every halfpenny they could gather up they went and raided might box and anything anyone that'd be on to you we have you a hundred dollars and they bet that the whole uh, housing market was going to crash so when he was betting on making money going up, they were betting on making money money coming down. And there had to be a loser. And when they won, they had the contract, they had to be paid. And the institutions that paid them had to pull their money back from Quinn. The idea that you can have these deals and contracts on international money markets and behave like an Irish paddy and say, oh, you're not coming near me, that is absolutely baloney. And even if it was in the middle of the IRA violence in the North and the UVF and the Troubles, even if it was 1982 when it was at its height, they would push. They would do anything not to let him off. And I could tell him that myself. Okay. Now, he went down anyway and all his business was sold off and that's 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 the end of that. But well, enter the end of the thing. Enter into this another guy here uh, that come into it. Now, not directly connected with Quinn. Dublin Jimmy. Dublin Jimmy. Dublin Jimmy. Sir McGuinness, a Dublin Gurrier. He was bombing for the IRA in England, so the IRA weren't going to touch him. And he moved down into Fermanagh, and everyone was afraid of the life of him. And if you spoke anything against him or you happened, happened to see something and tell the police or tell the guards or tell anything or talk about him, he'd burn you out of it. And he burned several properties. He specialised in calling to houses, yards and all that at night and filling them with petrol and putting the whole thing up in flames. That was his act. Now, Quinn says he didn't pay him anything. The rumour is that he, he was paid a million by someone and he did uh, complain that he didn't do anything. And eventually he was attacking the Quinn's, the, the, the ex-Quinn's property, running lorries into it and all that. Somebody was doing it. He denied it. But there was the attack on Kevin Lunny was arranged that nearly killed the man. And the two boys got very high, heavy sentences for that. But there was the attack on Kevin Lunny, who helped run the company after he left. He got a chance to come back into the company, but he just he was dictating everything and it couldn't go along with that and they had to throw him out. Dublin Jimmy took a trip to Buxton where he had a house in England. He had the money on Bitcoin, is a court from what I hear. He, with Bitcoin, if you don't have the codes, you can't get at your money, even yourself. There's no way of ringing up. If you don't keep those codes, you can't get in. That's how the blockchain works. So they must have followed him to Buxton or whatever, or they may not, but they knew he was there. And it looks like he didn't know. He didn't know they were watching him the way they were. And when the attack on Lunny happened, he was out of the country. He wasn't there at all. He was in England. He had the perfect alibi. But he was after having a heart surgery operation. Two guys from Dublin, North Wall and somewhere up there, were, were, were eventually convicted. For it, for the attack on Lunny. And when the when it happened, there was a big push, 
and the Gardaí will tell you that it was the Gardaí Shikana done the work in catching those fellas, that the police service of Northern Ireland didn't do that much. But when uh, Jimmy was in, in England, in Buxton, in his house, and the police raided the house, they raided the house, and they went straight for the computer, thinking it might be still on or switched on and that the codes would not, that the page would be open. If they could get the page open, they were in business at getting the money. But Dublin Jimmy come up and he couldn't understand how they knew he was there and he, he got such a fright he collapsed and he died on the floor. That's what happened. I don't know did they get the codes, I doubt it. I don't know did he leave the codes with anybody, I don't know. I doubt it. But there was money in there and that's why Bitcoin can be a profitable company because it's profitable because lots of people die, criminals and everything else, and the money's left there and it's never pulled out. It's a dodgy kind of a, kind of a, a thing. There's no, no way of checking it out or anything else. So that's the story. He came down his own greed. He thought he'd own Anglo-Irish banks. He could have done with a good advisor. I think I know where he'd have got one. But he didn't go for that. And now he's writing the book with all this. He says he has no money. Some people says he has millions in Russia. Best of luck to anyone trying to get millions out of Russia. Oh, the best, the best of luck. If you just you need it, I'll tell you. Now, I'm nothing really again, Quinn, as such. I, I, you know, it was a mixed bag. But greed. Greed. And the Paddy the Irishman, I don't think there's anything as greedy. Oh, he sees bars of gold. But it's like the windmills. And another thing before I go about Quinn, he was one of the first to put up windmills. That's a big no-no. You don't do that and stay in my good books. That is the sign of a pure ignoramus. A sign of an ignoramus. No matter what you do, anyone should know they're a bloody scam. Anyway, folks, that's it. That's Quinn and his book. <laughs> he go easy now and he lost a fortune. He did lose an absolute fortune. Uh... It was a pity for the area. If it had to go right, he could have, you know, he nearly had what the makings of a big town down there. It could, could have been called Quintown or something. He was going to make beer and he was going to do, and he was doing glass bottles. A lot of basic things like that, good ideas like that that nobody else would ever set up. And he had a mind to open a power station in RD in County Loud. He was talking about opening a power station in RD in County Loud. He was. That wasn't such a bad idea. That came to nothing. He, had a, he was a prolific type of a entrepreneur and that, but he just needed a bit of wit and he was greedy now and I don't know what he'll do now. I think his things he does turns to profit. He's good that way. He is good He is good that way. Now, anyone that had a job down in that area, this deprived area, I mean, he, he was good. He was great that way. Those that had jobs, you got your job and you could work locally. You didn't have to go to Dublin or go to Sligo or anything else. Just needed a bit of balance, a bit of wit, and all of that sort of stuff. And <laughs> as I say again, greedy. If, however, Dublin Jimmy was involved with the Queen Empire, I don't know. But he did work for them. He did damage. He attacked property. And he was prepared even to get his men to either wound or kill that firm. And when a company has to resort to that, it loses any respect I would have for it. I don't know who he says he had nothing to do with Dublin Jimmy. Dublin Jimmy didn't do that for nothing. Well, it could be somebody completely outside Quinn's circle. But it happened anyway. It happened. And lucky enough, Lonnie survived. Dublin Jimmy's no bloody riddance. He's good riddance. And uh, we're, all, so we're all still here. We'll see what will happen. Uh, so, greedy. Too greedy. Not prepared to share. Not the best way to be. And didn't research contracts for differences. He was betting on it going up when everyone else, smart fellas, were betting on it coming down. You can't have you can't have a winner on both sides. Give me a thumbs up and please comment, please comment or thumbs down if you don't agree with what I'm saying. And uh, we'll see you back for something else soon. Good luck.